In 1898, my husband, Pierre Curie, and I discovered the radio elements polonium and radium. And in 1903, we shared with Radioactivity's discoverer, Henri Becquerel, a Nobel Prize for this work. Tragically, three years later, Pierre died in an accident. My daughter, Irene, became a big support to me. My mother. Maria Curie had a strong influence on me. But I was different from her, more like my father. She once said that she had no more doubts about me than she had about herself. It is a new century, a golden age for Europe known as the Belle Epoque, the beautiful era. It is a period of peace and prosperity. Arts and culture, science and technology are flourishing. In the shade of the Eiffel Tower, the world's tallest structure, Visitors to the 1900 Paris World's Fair are dazzled by symbols of progress, from a diesel engine running on peanut oil to the first talking films. The natural sciences are being transformed as well. It is into this world that Irene Curie is born. At the end of the 1800s, it was obvious that a new physics was bursting out of our laboratories. Röntgen discovered a new kind of ray, a penetrating ray, a ray that defied all the laws of Isaac Newton. They called it X-rays, which opened up a whole field of medicine. Then, in August 1914, peace is shattered and the Great War erupts. The political order of 19th century Europe disintegrates. The carnage is unprecedented. One of the great difficulties for surgeons at the front lines is how to locate bullets and shrapnel in the bodies of the wounded because X-ray equipment is not available on the battlefield. Eager to contribute to the war effort, Marie Curie launches a large-scale program to convert trucks and cars into mobile X-ray vehicles. The use of X-rays revolutionized medicine on the battlefield. There were tens of thousands of troops with shrapnel and bullets all over their bodies. And in those days, doctors would get a scalpel and simply poke into living tissue, making mincemeat out of muscle tissue. Then with the coming of X-rays, within an instant, you can identify the precise location of that bullet or shrapnel. Marie is accompanied by her young daughter, Irene, who works as a technician in one of these mobile units. 17-year-old Irene soon becomes solely responsible for the functioning of her unit, teaching seasoned military surgeons how to take advantage of the portable X-ray for wounded soldiers. The Belgian army doctor felt his way through the mangled flesh of a young soldier's leg, Searching in vain for shrapnel, the doctor met my gaze. Pointing to an x-ray of the leg, I calmly observed that. According to the logic of three-dimensional geometry, he should enter the patient from another angle. When the surgeon finally took my advice, he immediately located the shrapnel. Unusual expenses. Champagne, three francs. Telegrams, one franc, ten. Illnesses, chemist and nurse, 71 francs 50. These entries from Marie Curie's expense ledger for September 12, 1897, are emblems of a momentous day in the Curie household. The birth of Marie and Pierre's first child, a little girl they named Irene. Just four years later in 1903, Marie and Pierre win the Nobel Prize in Physics along with Henri Becquerel for their pioneering discoveries in radioactivity, the phenomenon that certain elements spontaneously emit electrically charged particles. The Curies have discovered two radioactive elements, which they have named polonium and radium. 
With the creation of radium and polonium, it was obvious that a new law of physics was being born. The nuclear force, the force that drives the universe itself, the force that allowed for the creation of the fireball which gave birth to the heavens and the earth, the nuclear force was an entirely new force pioneered by Madame Curie, and it was radium and polonium that opened the way to unlock the secret of the atom itself. Overnight, the Curies become celebrities. The Nobel Prize money allows Pierre to reduce his teaching duties. He and Marie devote more time to research with long periods in the lab. Six-year-old Irene sees little of her parents. In 1904, Irene's sister Eve is born, yet another demand on her parents' time. Ma mère me disait effectivement qu'elle aimait être seule avec ses parents et que ce n'était pas toujours le cas, euh, qu'elle aimait être avec des petites amies qu'elle connaissait bien. Euh, elle racontait souvent l'histoire du sou que représentait la Madeleine Nobel pour s'amuser avec. The lives of Marie and her daughters changed dramatically on April 19th, 1906. Pierre is killed in a horse carriage accident. For such a young child, uh, you can assume that it was really a shock and a trauma that one of the, of the two most beloved persons have left her. Huh? But on the other hand, uh, she was still surrounded by her loving mother, but who was a kind of living dad. Her whole life was broken because her loved husband was dead. After the funeral, although deep in grief, Marie returns to her laboratory. By 1908, damage to her health from radiation exposure is already becoming obvious. Her fingers are badly burnt, and she suffers from constant fatigue. Little Lorraine becomes her mother's main support. Où ma mère s'est trouvée finalement euh, être appelée à seconder Marie Curie, ce qu'elle a fait tout naturellement, et ce qui lui a donné Je dirais une place auprès d'elle. At age 12, Irene enrolls at the Collège Savigny, a prestigious private secondary school. She shoots the top of the class in science. During these years, Irene and Marie correspond when they are apart. July 1914. My dear Mama, I would love to see you, my sweet. It pains me not to be able to hug and kiss you before going to bed. October, 1916. Dear Mama, my trip yesterday went very well. I was welcomed at the station by two young soldiers who seemed unable to be serious for one second. May, 1918. Today I had a great moment of joy. Monsignor Rigaud brought me my first salary, the first money I have ever earned. Hugs and kisses from all my heart. Irene. In November 1918, World War I is finally over. The victorious French are jubilant. Marie Curie moves into a brand new research building in Paris, the Radium Institute. Irene is appointed her mother's assistant, and uh, for me the question is, uh, why should uh, the director of a laboratory not employ any person like Irene, who had already as a child and at school shown how gifted she was in mathematics and in physics? In these post-war years, there is an acute shortage of funds at the Institute. So in 1921, Irene and her sister Eve accompany Marie to the United States on a fundraising junket for the Radium Institute. The journey is organized by Mrs. Marie Mattingly Maloney. Missy, as she is nicknamed, is an American socialite and journalist who has embraced the Curie's cause. The highlight of their trip is a visit to the White House, where President Harding presents Marie with an entire gram of radium worth over $100,000.
During their stay in the U.S., Iren, emerging from the shadows, stands in for her mother repeatedly because Marie is too ill. The American press is struck by Irene's maturity, and articles appear with headlines like, Mademoiselle Curie would rather work than flit as a butterfly, and Mademoiselle Curie has no time for social frivolity. Missy and Irene become good friends and will correspond throughout their lives. Dear Missy, we arrived yesterday in Paris with the radium. Our crossing was good, though the sea was rather gray and ugly. And as you had promised that it would be blue, flat, and beautiful, we were sadly surprised. By the 1920s, research in atomic physics is making extraordinary progress. All over the world, scientists are finally unlocking the secrets contained in the structure of the atom. In the 1920s, an atom was pictured as a thin cloud of electrons with a tiny nucleus at its center, 100,000 times smaller than the atom as a whole. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were scientists who did not even believe in the existence of atoms. And yet, in the 1920s and 30s, not only did we prove the existence of atoms, we probed right into the interior, the heart of the atoms itself. Irene Curie proves to be a scientist of the same caliber as her mother. She earns her bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics. She then conducts her own independent research that contributes to her doctoral thesis at the Sorbonne. C'est sur les propriétés physiques des des rayons émis par le polonium qu'elle avança son travail de doctorat. C'est sur l'ionisation des rayons alpha qu'elle travailla pour soutenir sa thèse en 1925. Many mornings, Irene begins the day in her mother's bedroom, where these two kindred spirits share breakfast and laboratory talk. One morning's coffee and croissants brings a surprise announcement. Irene is engaged to marry one of her mother's lab assistants. I had been inspired by Marie and Pierre Curie, and one day I found myself in front of Marie's desk. I stood nervously in my army uniform as I was still in the military service in the anti-gas corps. I wanted a place in her laboratory, and my professor had recommended me even though I did not have the proper academic credentials. Then she said, can you begin work tomorrow? <laughs> I explained to her that I still had three weeks left of my military service to complete. She said, I will write to your colonel. The next day, I was her assistant. In December 1924, a handsome young man applies for work at Marie Curie's Radium Institute. He is an engineer, but lacks a bachelor's degree. Although skeptical of his missing academic credential, Marie decides to give him a chance. His name is Frederic Joyeux. But to his dismay, he soon encounters the sharp tongue of his boss's daughter. Ma mère n'avait aucune notion de politesse et mon père est reparti et a dit à son meilleur ami « Je ne resterai pas plus d'une semaine dans cet euh, laboratoire, la fille de la patronne est insupportable. <laughs> » If Irene is rude, she is also remarkable and soon wins over the young man's affections. They take strolls through the park. He often walks her home after work. I didn't have the slightest idea that we might marry one day, but I watched her. With her cold appearance, her forgetting to say hello, she didn't always create sympathy around herself in the laboratory. I discovered in this young woman an extraordinary poetic and sensitive being who was a living representation of her father. Dear Missy, I have to tell you about a happy event in my life. I am going to get married. His name is Frederick Joliot. He works in the Institute of Radium. He loves science, and we hope to work together. On peut difficilement imaginer deux personnages aussi différents. Mon père était un homme extrêmement séduisant 
qui aimait séduire euh, et qui réussissait très bien. Euh, ma mère était au contraire, donnait l'impression de quelqu'un d'un peu froid, ce qui n'était absolument pas le cas. Mother Marie is not enthusiastic about this union. Not only is she bothered by Frederick's academic deficiencies, she is dismayed that he smokes, listens to popular French music, never shuts up, and is outspoken about his leftist politics. Et en fait, mon père disait toujours qu'il a eu beaucoup de mal à s'imposer dans le milieu. Et c'est finalement au moment où il a passé sa thèse que euh, les autres se sont dit « mais tout compte fait, ce n'est pas simplement Marie d'Irene Curie, mais euh, c'est un excellent scientifique ». C'est à cette époque qu'il a réussi à s'imposer, mais il en garde un souvenir, il en a toujours gardé un souvenir assez douloureux de ses débuts. Challenged to prove himself, Frederick continues his studies at the Sorbonne. He proves to be a superb scientist, and even Marie revises her opinion, commenting to a friend. That boy there is a skyrocket. Dear Missy, my husband would like to join the name of Curie to his name, and to the name of our child. In 1927, Frederick and Irene welcome their first child, Hélène, into the world. Shortly thereafter, Irene contracts tuberculosis. Ma mère euh, a été atteinte très jeune euh, de la tuberculose et cette maladie l'a marquée pendant toute sa vie. Très régulièrement, elle partait quelques semaines en montagne pour se reposer. Dear Missy, I would like to give Hélène a little brother or sister. But till now, the doctors have told me it would be dangerous for my health. So, we must wait. I have much work in the laboratory, and I am very glad of it. My husband will pass his thesis of Doctor of Sciences in a few days. As Frederick completes his doctorate, he and Irene embark on their first joint research projects. They begin to publish together. In 1929, the American stock market crashes. The Great Depression sends the world economy into chaos. By 1931, its effects in France are full-blown. Exports drop by 62%. Almost a million people are unemployed. Yet even as the economic crisis deepens, scientists continue to make fundamental discoveries. The mysteries of the atom are unraveled by a coterie of European researchers. Ernest Rutherford in England, Niels Bohr in Denmark, Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn in Germany, and Enrico Fermi in Italy. In the 1930s, we begin to understand the structure of the nucleus itself. In other words, a new physics was being created right before our eyes. In Paris, the Radium Institute is at the forefront of research on the atomic nucleus. By 1931, Irene and Frédéric have almost two grams of radium at their disposal. From this valuable stock, they isolate a large quantity of polonium, which emits a steady stream of alpha particles that can be used in a variety of nuclear experiments. With this, they make an important contribution towards solving a puzzle at the heart of the atom, the composition of its nucleus. Up to this point, physicists believe that nuclei consist of protons and electrons. Irene and Frederick are intrigued by the work of German physicist Walther Botha. Botha placed radium in a lead box with a small hole in one end. Alpha particles shot out of the hole in a pencil-thin beam. When this beam was shot at targets of various substances, including beryllium, a lightweight metal, both have found that mysterious particles emerged from the other side. He suspected that it was a new highly energetic type of gamma radiation. Irene and Frederick take both his work a step further. They use polonium, a more plentiful source of alpha particle. They shoot them at a beryllium target and direct the mysterious beam that comes out the other side into a block of paraffin wax, which contains hydrogen nuclei, or protons. 
They discover that the mysterious beam knocks protons out of the wax at a tremendous rate, with at least 10 times more power than ordinary gamma radiation does. But like Botha, Arendt and Frederick mistakenly think that this is a new, highly energetic type of gamma radiation. In January 1932, the Joliot-Curies published an article describing what they have found. In Cambridge, physicist Ernest Rutherford and his collaborator James Chadwick read the article and are skeptical. Lorsque ce résultat arriva sous forme imprimée à Cambridge, Rutherford a dit à Chadwick, je ne crois pas, je n'y crois pas. Répétez l'expérience. In February of 1932, James Chadwick in England repeats the experiment of the Joliet Curies, but he goes a little step farther. He measures the mass of this new mysterious ray and finds out that it's comparable to that of a proton. In other words, a new particle had been discovered, christened the neutron. Well, the Joliet Curies are nominated for a Nobel Prize, but the Nobel Prize goes to James Chadwick for the discovery of a new particle, the neutron. Dear Missy, we have a son, a little boy named Pierre. We are very glad to have a daughter and a son. I am obliged to take some rest, but not for long. My husband and I have worked together in collaboration this year with very interesting results. quand il travaillait, travaillait de manière extraordinairement passionnée, mais ils ont toujours eu ce besoin de détente. Et quand ils étaient en vacances, qu'on n'entendait pratiquement pas parler de science, et quand ils revenaient au laboratoire, ils étaient beaucoup plus innovants. As Marie's health worsens, Arène is appointed assistant director of the Institute. she and Frederick embark on a study of neutrons. To visualize these neutrons, they use a device called a Wilson cloud chamber. As charged particles travel through the chamber, they cause tiny droplets of water vapor to condense around them, leaving a trail of vapor easily seen by the eye. These tracks of tiny subatomic particles can be photographed and studied. The Joliot Curies find several unusual tracks, which they interpret as coming from electrons that are moving the opposite direction from the others. But in fact, they are mistaken. An American physicist, Carl D. Anderson, performs a similar experiment and shows that the unusual tracks are from positrons, positive electrons, and not from ordinary electrons. The positron is a new and very strange particle, not ordinary matter, but antimatter. When a positron encounters an ordinary electron, both of them are instantly annihilated in a blaze of energy. Anderson wins the Nobel Prize for this remarkable discovery. The Joliet Curies perhaps were not radical enough to reinterpret their own data, which was staring them in the face. Who would have thought there would be a whole zoo of subatomic particles? Who would have thought there, there could be antimatter and possibly anti universes? What cannot be missed, even by secluded scientists, are the ever darkening clouds on Europe's political landscape. The Nazis come to power in Germany in January 1933 and initiate their program of massive racial oppression. Soon Hitler joins forces with Mussolini in Italy. In Paris, Irene and Frederick begin new experiments, again using their polonium. They said, well, let's bombard different substances with these alpha rays and basically see what happens. So they bombarded aluminum with alpha rays and they found some radiation coming out, which wasn't too surprising. But then they saw that even when they turned off the source, even when they took away the alpha rays that were bombarding it, they were still getting radiation coming out. 
Le Joliot Curie's research earns them an invitation to the prestigious Solvay Congress in Brussels in the fall of 1933. The global elite of nuclear physicists is in attendance, including Ernest Rutherford and James Chadwick, Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Niels Bohr, Ernest O. Lawrence, Lisa Meitner, and Marie Curie. These physicists are engaged in new experiments debating new theories of the nucleus. The Joliot Curies present their most recent work, but they cannot deliver a convincing explanation of what their experimental findings mean. Lisa Meitner and others doubt their interpretation. Back in Paris, Irene and Frederick return to the laboratory. Once again, the lights burn late at the Institute as they continue their experiments, using the alpha radiation from polonium to bombard different elements. Frederick places the polonium next to the cloud chamber. The alpha rays strike a thin aluminum foil on the outside of the chamber, creating a shower of protons and positrons that can be seen in the cloud chamber. If enough absorbing material is placed between the polonium and the aluminum, the reaction stops. However, the emission of positrons continues. A secondary type of radioactive material is being produced, even though there are no more alpha rays to drive the reaction. To confirm this curious result, they use a Geiger counter. Each time, the secondary radiation of positrons continues, even after the alpha source is removed. The Joliots have finally hit the bullseye. With the neutron, they have misinterpreted. With the positron, they have misunderstood. But now, they have discovered artificial radioactivity, and they know they are right. I was given a tiny test tube of the substance, and I held it up to a Geiger counter. When I heard the familiar click, 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 I knew this meant a Nobel Prize for my daughter and son-in-law. Irene and Frederick, indeed, are awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1935. particulièrement heureuse si la distinction qui m'est accordée peut servir la cause du travail féminin, si elle peut aider à sauvegarder le droit le plus précieux des femmes, le droit d'exercer dans les mêmes conditions que les hommes les professions pour lesquelles elles sont qualifiées par leur instruction et leur travail. When we look at the work of Madame Curie, we realize that she unraveled the secrets of natural radioactivity. But the Joliot Curies were able to induce artificial radioactivity. They were able to change at will one element into another. And that in turn paved the way for nuclear medicine, for cosmology, to understand the secret of the stars themselves. Sadly, Marie does not live to witness their triumph. She dies in July 1934 and is buried alongside her husband Pierre in a family plot. In 1995, their bodies are moved to the Pantheon, the mausoleum for the remains of great French men, and now also for a great French woman. Just as the Joliot Curies reach the height of their scientific fame, France is engulfed in clashes between the right and the left. Violent demonstrations take place in Paris. The French left is united under the banner of the Popular Front and wins the 1936 elections. Irene and Frederick publicly support the anti-fascist movement. An atheist and politically to the left, Irene is also a feminist. Even though women in France do not yet have the right to vote, she's appointed to a government post. Dear Missy, I have accepted to enter into the new government. For the first time in France, women are in the government. But I have accepted only on the condition that I will soon resign to resume my scientific work. She becomes the Undersecretary of State for Scientific Research. Dear Missy, the house where we live now is outside Paris. 
We need about 20 minutes in auto to go to the laboratory. In about a year, there will be an electric train. Very convenient for us. C'était rassemblement le dimanche qui commençait par euh, ceux qui jouaient au tennis. Les autres étaient sur la pelouse, bien, et puis ça discutait. Les enfants jouaient dans l'arrière partie du jardin, arrivait le moment où on sortait de quoi se rafraîchir un petit peu, mais enfin, ça n'était pas du tout. On va rendre visite aux Joliots, ça, c'était pas ça du tout. La maison ouverte, d'une certaine manière. June 1937. Dear Missy, My husband will now be a professor at the Collège de France, and I will be a professor at the Sorbonne in his place. Of course, I will continue to work at the Radium Institute. By 1937, the Joliot Curies no longer work shoulder to shoulder in the same laboratory. Irene begins a new investigation that will have profound and unexpected repercussions for the history of the time. She has long been interested in the work of Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. Fermi has been using neutrons to bombard the nuclei of many elements with striking experimental results. In the 1930s, with the discovery of the neutron, people had a new rifle, a new bullet, by which to probe the secrets of the atom, and Enrico Fermi pioneered it, not just to analyze the elements, the lower elements like beryllium and boron, but higher elements like uranium. And there was some speculation that because uranium was so massive, with so many protons and neutrons, perhaps it could be split. In the 1930s, physicists and chemists are scrambling to understand what happens when neutrons bombard uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring element. Irene conducts her own experiments. In 1937, she finds a new radioactive substance that resembles the known element lanthanum. Irene publishes the curious finding. Il a toutes les propriétés du lantane, mais il s'en distingue sans doute. In Berlin, Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner read Irene's article and are very skeptical. Responding to their doubts, Irene redoes her experiment and gets the same result. She publishes again. Otto Hahn still disagrees. He asks his assistant Fritz Strassmann to look into the matter. Strassmann lit cet article et arrive à la conclusion que ce résultat doit être correct, mais l'interprétation pose des problèmes. Strassmann takes a different approach and finds that the curious substance that Irene thinks is lanthanum actually behaves more like radium. In the fall of 1938, Hahn and Strassmann launch a new series of experiments. They find that when uranium is bombarded with neutrons, it is not radium, but barium that is produced. Barium is so much smaller than uranium that the result seems to defy everything that is known about nuclear physics. Hahn and Strassmann do not yet understand that the nucleus has split. Hahn contacts Lisa Meitner, who by late 1938 has fled Nazi Germany for a possible explanation. C'est à ce moment-là que Lise Meitner et son neveu Otto Frisch arrive à comprendre de quelle manière l'uranium peut éclater en deux fragments plus petits. When I read Hahn and Strassmann's article, I was furious Frederick had not been working with me. I rarely used obscenities, but this time I exploded. Oh, what dumb asses we've been! Indeed, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of nuclear fission is awarded to Otto Hahn. Dear Missy, we are more than ever depressed by the international events. It is sad to see papers celebrating as saviors the madmen Hitler and Mussolini. I suppose also that fascism has the germs for destruction and will have time to destroy civilization. By the spring of 1939, Nazi Germany's militarism and aggression are obvious, and the possibility of building an atomic bomb based on the discovery of nuclear fission is very real. Scientists were horrified 
They realized that the war clouds were looming, and what if, what if the atomic bomb fell into the wrong hands? The consequences would be enormous. And the key step, the key step to this whole process was the chain reaction. How do you take the energy of one tiny atom that you can't even see, and how do you magnify it to trillions upon trillions of time to create an atomic bomb? The missing link is the chain reaction. Frederick begins experiments to determine if a chain reaction is possible. He finds that whenever a uranium nucleus splits, two or three neutrons are emitted, enough to keep the fission process going. When a neutron hits the nucleus of a uranium atom, it splits. Two to three more neutrons are then released. These secondary neutrons can, in turn, split more uranium nuclei, which in turn release more neutrons, which split even more. This is a chain reaction. A single neutron is enough to set off the splitting of trillions upon trillions of other atoms. This self-sustaining chain reaction can release up to 100 million times the energy ever before known. It could lead to a nuclear detonation of unprecedented force, unless the rate of fission process is controlled or reduced. Joliot is the first to demonstrate that fission produces enough secondary neutrons to make a chain reaction possible. He publishes his results in an article in the journal Nature, which appears on April 22, 1939. He is the first to demonstrate that fission produces enough secondary neutrons to start a chain reaction, raising the possibility of nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors. Nineteen thirty-nine. Dear Missy, we continue to work in the laboratory, even as the winds of war are blowing. I continue to cure my anemia and my lungs. I am now happy to say that I am in much better health. On September 1st, 1939, German tanks roll across the border into Poland. It is a blitzkrieg, a lightning war, and within four weeks, Poland surrenders. France and England declare war on Germany. Joliot writes to his mother, I work to forget the stupidity of men. Dear Missy, we are again at war. It seems impossible to live on the same continent with the Germans. The Institute of Radium in Warsaw is damaged, and the radium there has disappeared. We do not know if the Germans have taken it, or if it was lost in an attempt by the director to secure it for the director has also disappeared. Many university professors of Poland are already in concentration camps. Dans ce contexte, Joliot transfère son programme de recherche au ministère de l'Armement. Une mobilisation scientifique organisée par le gouvernement français, le soutien financier, le soutien euh, dans tous les domaines pour pouvoir mener ses recherches à bien. Frederick is trying to produce a controlled chain reaction hoping to develop fission as a new source of energy. He realizes that in order to slow down the neutrons, a moderator is needed. The Germans know that too, and they are not far behind him. One possible moderator is heavy water, similar to ordinary water, except that the H in H2O is replaced with deuterium, a heavier isotope of hydrogen. Heavy water is scarce and expensive. The only large-scale supplier in the world is the Norsk Hydro Electric Company in Norway. The German chemical conglomerate IG Farben owns 25% of the company, and Frederick is convinced the Nazi regime wants the heavy water. He contacts Raoul Daughtry. Daughtry was one of the leading figures in the French industrial establishment, and Daughtry was the kind of person that you would go to to get things done. I briefed the Minister of Defense, Monsieur Raoul Daltry, about heavy water's significance in fission research. Daltry had known that I.G. Farben was interested in the heavy water through French intelligence reports, but he was mystified as to why the Germans would want heavy water. It seems that I.G. Farben was demanding that two tons of heavy water be shipped to Germany immediately. Daltry instructed me to buy Norsk Hydro's entire stock and bring it to France. A French team of spies is dispatched to Norway. The team is headed by Lieutenant Jacques Allier. 
job of Allier's team was to bring back as much heavy water as possible to France. Allier was traveling under the name of Freiss. He carried with him a letter of credit for 36 million French francs, or about a million and a half dollars. Their mission was to bring all the heavy water back to Paris. And any they couldn't bring back to attempt to destroy it, to render it so that it could not be used for atomic experiments. The heavy water was sealed into 26 cans, but German agents knew of Allier's mission. Our own intelligence intercepted a telegram which read, at any price, intercept a suspect Frenchman traveling under the name of Freiss. No, Allier repart secretement avec ses bidons d'eau lourde vers l'aéroport d'Oslo. Allier pretended to be boarding the flight to Holland, but our agents created a charade. Allier and the cans were quickly loaded on the plane to Scotland. The other plane took off. German fighter planes forced it down and found nothing. Finalement, l'eau lourde est arrivée sain et sauf à Paris, au Collège de France. They made it just in time. One month later, on April 9th, 1940, German troops invade Norway. Soon after, Germany attacks France. And on June 14th, Paris falls. Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain is forced to sign a humiliating armistice. A brutal occupation begins. Frederick must find a new hiding place for the heavy water. Paris fell. The Minister of Armament ordered all French scientists to leave the country. He arranged for us to take the heavy water to England aboard the Broom Park, a British ship that was to carry refugees to England. The port of Bordeaux is in chaos and crammed with thousands of refugees and troops. On our way to Bordeaux, I dropped rain off at a sanatorium. She carried with her the Institute's radium. Irene feared that the Nazis would make use of the radium if it fell into their hands. Along with the heavy water and Frederick's research papers, the Broom Park also carries many of France's top scientists who will join the British nuclear research program. But Frederick and Irene remain in France. L'engagement anti-nazi ou anti-fasciste de Joliot est ancien, et donc dans le contexte de l'occupation nazie, allemande nazie, euh, Joliot pense qu'il a des responsabilités à assumer, et que son prestige scientifique, le prix Nobel, etc., augmente encore ses responsabilités. Donc la question de l'exil, de quitter la France, d'abandonner de, de, un certain combat politique, euh, il la tranche dans le sens de rester et de prendre des risques en France. The heavy water is eventually placed in the custody of the Royal Librarian at Windsor Castle. Si les Allemands avaient réussi à intercepter le stock d'eau lourde, ils auraient pu encore pendant la guerre parvenir à construire un réacteur nucléaire en fonctionnement. Dear Missy, we think we have a mission to fill to prevent the dispersal of the scientific workers from our laboratories and the loss of the means of work collected by the efforts of my mother and ourselves. C'est le fait que Joliot sait tout de suite, dès l'été 1940, qu'il va être sous la surveillance de scientifiques allemands à Paris, à la tête desquels est nommé Wolfgang Gentner. Or, celui-ci est un ami très proche de Joliot, qui a travaillé au laboratoire Curie, ils sont restés constamment en contact, et Gentner est un anti-nazi euh, clairement déterminé. Donc Joliot pense qu'il va pouvoir s'entendre avec Gentner pour assurer sa sécurité. Euh, il a accepté de revenir dans son laboratoire sous réserve qu'il a abandonné toute recherche euh, dont les conséquences pouvaient être euh, d'ordre militaire. Joliot becomes a leading member of the French resistance, which has taken up arms against the Nazis. He joins the Front National, its main resistance organization, 
later becoming its president. He co-founds an underground newspaper, writes pamphlets, and helps Jewish scientists and their families to escape deportation and death. Dear Missy, I had at the end of January a bronchitis. Both our laboratories function, not in very good condition, of course, but there is some work being done. Do not be anxious about us. The bombardments are not at all in our vicinity. Pendant l'occupation, Irene est à son laboratoire. Directrice de laboratoire à l'Institut du Radium, elle travaille. Mais elle est très malade. Elle a un retour en force de la tuberculose qui la met hors jeu pendant des, des mois. Et elle est à plusieurs reprises en sanatorium, soit dans le sud de la France, soit même elle passe plusieurs mois en Suisse pour être soignée. Et elle revient ensuite en France. C'est donc quelqu'un qui, en permanence, devait euh, d'abord devait avoir un rythme de travail un peu limité. Elle rentrait quand même relativement tôt du laboratoire. As clandestine activities increase, so do Nazi countermeasures. On Sunday morning, June 21st, 1941, while having breakfast at home with his family, Frederick is arrested by the German SS. Wolfgang Gentner uses his connection to the German high command and intervenes on Frederick's behalf. He is released the same day. As the occupation got more and more brutal, some of Joliot's friends were arrested, some of them were tortured, some of them were killed. En France, pendant la résistance, beaucoup de gens sont devenus communistes. Pas pas tellement par conviction communiste, mais parce que c'était le meilleur endroit pour lutter contre les nazis et contre le régime de Vichy. Many of the people that Joliot knew were communists, and at that point he decided to join the Communist Party. And as he later said on several occasions, I became a communist because I am a patriot. Joliot was arrested for a second time by the Nazis and again released. He begins to fear for his life and for the safety of his family. La menace se précise. Donc Joliot va prendre un certain nombre de dispositions et entre autres, il va décider d'évacuer sa famille clandestinement vers la Suisse, Irène et les enfants, et d'autre part, lui-même plonge dans une clandestinité totale. Il quitte son domicile et il quitte le laboratoire, il n'y revient plus. In 1944, Allied troops land in Normandy, bringing the war closer to an end. General Charles de Gaulle, the exiled leader of Free France, returns to the capital in a victory parade along the Champs-Élysées. Joliot is part of de Gaulle's entourage. He is also part of the team that is to rebuild French science. He learns that the Americans are close to completing the first atomic bomb and briefs de Gaulle about nuclear fission. Frederick wants France to develop a nuclear energy program for peacetime use. De Gaulle agrees, but does not exclude military options. On May 1, 1945, holed up in his Berlin bunker, Adolf Hitler commits suicide. Germany surrenders to the Allies. Irene and Frederick return home. On August 6, 1945, an American plane, the Enola Gay, drops an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, killing an estimated 200,000. Three days later, a second bomb is dropped on the port of Nagasaki, killing approximately 140,000. Japan surrenders. In the eyes of Irene and Frederick, this use of nuclear fission is a betrayal of science and mankind because their own research and work contributed to the development of the bomb 
they are haunted by the sense that they share in the blame. L'un et l'autre, mais en tirer la conclusion, le scientifique ne peut plus se contenter de dire « voilà ce que j'ai trouvé euh, ». Il doit se préoccuper de, des applications, euh, des découvertes qu'il peut faire et de son travail, de son travail en général. Donc, euh, il doit être à la fois scientifique et, et citoyen. In the fall of 1945, Charles de Gaulle asks Frederick to develop a plan for an atomic energy program. Il a demandé à mon père de lancer euh, donc le commissariat à l'énergie atomique. Et il a donc été nommé haut commissaire à l'énergie atomique et c'est mon père qui a lancé donc euh, l'énergie atomique française. Iran becomes part of the team as well. In only three years, France will inaugurate its first atomic pile. Frederick writes in L'Humanité, I am personally convinced that atomic energy will be of service to mankind in peacetime. Joliot took it upon himself, as did other scientists, to make sure that this moral force was exerted, that people would see the atomic bomb as something that should never be used. But as the Cold War intensifies, the United States is convinced that the Soviet Union under Stalin is building its own nuclear bomb. Iran and Frederick become involved in the campaign for the banning of atomic weapons. But the arms race is unstoppable. In 1949, the Soviet Union becomes a nuclear power. The conservative press denounces Joliot. His ties with Soviet scientists are regarded with suspicion. Conservatives suggest that he might actually share nuclear research results with colleagues in communist countries. Que Joliot fait une déclaration au début de l'année 1949 devant la presse anglo-américaine réunie à Paris, qui l'interview pour cette occasion, et il dit que en aucun cas un scientifique français et lui personnellement ne donnerait des renseignements sur les recherches qu'il mène à une puissance étrangère. But the damage has been done. In 1950, Frederick is removed from his position as the High Commissioner for Atomic Energy. Il y a en France à cette époque une chasse aux sorcières, comme il y a eu aux États-Unis, et que tous les communistes qui sont à des postes de responsabilité sont progressivement écartés. Mais on pourrait dire comme Robert Oppenheimer aux États-Unis. Sans éviction euh, de la direction de l'énergie atomique, mes parents ont ont très durement ressenti, mon père tout particulièrement, euh, son il s'y était entièrement, euh, il s'y était consacré avec passion, je crois avec une très très grande efficacité, et je pense que c'était euh, une période extrêmement dure dans sa vie. In just a few years after Frederick's ouster, France launches its own atomic weapons program. In February 1956, returning from a skiing trip, Irene once more checks herself into the hospital. It is not tuberculosis this time. She is diagnosed with acute leukemia, the result of a lifetime of exposure to radiation. To a friend, she confides, I have my mother's illness. Irene Joliot Curie dies on March 17, 1956, at the age of 58. When the French government orders a state funeral, her family requests that the military and religious parts of the ceremony be omitted. Ma mère, elle avait une vue de la science, ce qui était beau, euh, parfois contemplative, euh, la curiosité, les énigmes, mais le contemplatif. Mon... Frederick survives his wife by two and a half years. His doctors are unsure whether the illness leading to his death is related to irradiation. Une certitude, et qui était valable pour mon père et ma mère, c'est qu'ils pensaient que la connaissance, la recherche fondamentale, était une nécessité absolue et que les progrès de la connaissance apporteraient plus de bien que de mal à l'humanité. Frédéric Joliot dies on August 14, 1958, at the age of 58. President Charles de Gaulle orders a state funeral. He is buried next to his wife.
all discoveries have this double aspect of being beneficial and destructive. We must always go forward. We cannot allow ourselves to refrain from doing research and extending knowledge. We need large resources of knowledge in order to progress, but also for fighting the disasters which are yet to come. We may ask ourselves whether it is to humanity's advantage to know the secrets of nature, whether we are mature enough to profit from them, whether this knowledge is not going to be to our detriment. I believe that humanity will gain more good than bad from new discoveries. My father said these words in 1903. I share his conviction that science is the foundation of all progress that improves human life and diminishes suffering.